What can change the nature of a man? You cannot change the nature of a man. I released a video a few months ago called The Most Philosophical Video Game Ever Made. The subject of that video was a game called Planescape Torment, released back in 1999, selling around half a million copies. It's a truly unfortunate sales figure because, no joke, that game taught me more about philosophy than I ever learned in school. It permanently changed my philosophical temperament, making me more open to ideas that might have otherwise seemed threatening. In effect, I learned about a number of philosophical systems whose ethics I could apply to my own life. Given this fact, I feel it's criminal that the game did not receive the attention and support it deserved. Thankfully, I was not only able to share this gift of a game with others through my video, but people told me my video encouraged them to purchase the game, because they too wanted to compensate the developers for their underappreciated work. Without exaggeration, getting those types of comments on that video was one of the most rewarding experiences I had as a YouTuber. That said, figuring out how to share this game with as many people as possible was tricky at first. When the average gamer is, understandably, more concerned with whether or not a game is entertaining instead of enlightening, it can be hard trying to make any philosophical game, let alone one that is 24 years old, stand out. My admittedly risky solution to this problem comes with my video titles. By calling something the most philosophical or the most profound, I inevitably entice people to see what my proposal is. And if mine doesn't line up with theirs, some people are prone to, let's say, feverish disagreement. Thankfully, when I make videos with these titles, people are mostly polite when they suggest alternatives. But there is one instance where people zealously, yet understandably, shouted forth their alternative. When I said Planescape Torment was the most philosophical video game ever made, hundreds of people said no. That honor goes to Disco Elysium. Before I explain what Disco Elysium is for those who have never heard of it, I need to address those offering this game up as their alternative champion. Contrary to what some people might believe, I did play Disco Elysium before I released my video on Planescape. Now, the inevitable question some of you are asking is, well, how could I possibly put Planescape above Disco? Well, I assure you, it wasn't without serious consideration. For the longest time, I struggled to put one above the other because, in my mind, their philosophical presentation seemed to be of the exact same level of quality. Anytime one threatened to eke out the other, their rival regained ground with a quality I had not considered. What finally enabled me to break the tie, though, was when I considered the type of philosophical approach both games had. Planescape not only focuses on a variety of philosophical topics, it makes all of them easily accessible to even the most inexperienced philosopher. Disco focuses on a narrower, more complicated set of topics, yet admittedly goes deeper than I feel Planescape did. So I asked myself, is a game more philosophical if the number of topics is fewer and more complicated, yet deeper, or if the number of topics is greater and more accessible, yet not as deep? It's an enormously subjective question. Both games have an enormous amount of knowledge to impart, but which method of delivery works best comes down to the type of person you are. For myself, Planescape's method worked slightly better but I can totally understand why people disagree. Now with that done and out of the way, I will quickly outline some of Disco Elysium's superior elements before I go into a synopsis and then a full-on analysis. As I just said, I believe Disco Elysium goes deeper with its philosophy than not just Planescape, but any game. And yes, I do consider games like Nier Automata and Deus Ex and Metal Gear when I say that. My justification for this statement basically comes down to how Disco Elysium involves the player in its philosophical exposition. 
Unlike Planescape, where a lot of the time you can safely observe multiple philosophies play out in the world around you without worrying about the long-term effects of interjecting your opinion, Disco mandates you put forward your opinion at virtually every turn. Then, the story and the gameplay shape themselves according to your chosen stances in order to see how far you are willing to go to defend them. For example, early on in the game, you will encounter a self-professed racist who is preventing you from talking to somebody that will help you solve a mystery. You can easily get by him if you agree with him that racism is good. Even if you don't actually agree that racism is good and you just say you do, this will impact your ability to have positive relationships with other NPCs in the future. If you're like me and you choose not to agree, you have to choose a more difficult approach. I could have attacked the racist if I had more points in my physical instrument stat in order to stand a chance in a fight. But even then, I don't believe violence was warranted in this scenario. So I had to find an alternative method which took longer and required me to put my preciously few skill points in the right places. And even then, I wasn't guaranteed victory, what with the game's dice roll system. This is just one of hundreds of examples throughout Disco Elysium where you are forced to consult and defend your philosophical outlook. It's a brilliantly reactive system, where seemingly every decision you make will bring some form of pain later on. Even if that's not true 100% of the time, it's true enough that you're constantly worried about it. Granted, having to constantly reflect on your morality doesn't sound like it would make for a fun gaming experience, and admittedly, sometimes it's not. It can be disheartening when it seems like you fail every time you try to do the right thing, and then things get worse when you chastise yourself for even thinking about employing easier yet nonetheless immoral methods. Having said that though, the few times where you do everything in accordance with your beliefs and you succeed, the feeling of moral vindication that you receive is unparalleled. The only question is, are you willing to contend with that difficulty in order to experience those sublime moments? Or will you end up like the majority of the characters in Disco Elysium, where you crumble under the weight of regret for your past actions, where you become resentful that you even had to make those decisions, and wish for a return to a happier, easier past? In order to best communicate how tempting those feelings of regret and resentment can be, I feel it would be best to review some of the events that took place prior to the events of Disco Elysium, and how they contributed to the pessimistic fog and gloom that permeates every corner of the game. The fictional world of Elysium houses seven continents, or quote-unquote Isolas. The majority of the story takes place on the Isola known as Insulinda, specifically on the island of Le Caillou, which houses the capital city of Revachal. In the present day, Revachal is a poverty-stricken, dilapidated hellhole. But it wasn't always this way. It was once the capital of the world, a constitutional monarchy that exported many valuable goods to the rest of Elysium. However, like with many monarchies in history, there were a series of kings that failed to live up to their duties, specifically those from the Philippian dynasty. Some were innocent of their failures on account of mental illness. Others were guilty of indulging in drugs. Eventually, a large enough segment of the populace became tired of monarchist inefficiencies and attempted to install a communist government. While they were successful in overthrowing the monarchy via the killing of its final suzerain, Frizzle I, and they did attempt to set up a commune over the course of two years, their efforts were consistently interrupted due to intervention from the other Isolas. Sometime during that two-year period, five of the Isolas formed a coalition to shut down the burgeoning communist state quickly and efficiently, via a series of aerial strikes called Operation Deathblow. The coalition was successful, forcing Revachal to relinquish their sovereignty and to become a laissez-faire capitalist state. In the 40-odd years that transpire between the end of the Revolutionary War and the events of Disco Elysium, several attempts are made by the people of Revachal to pick up the pieces and rebuild, and virtually all of them were complete and utter failures. According to one of the NPCs in the game, Joyce Messier, 
That period of 40 years saw another war that lasted an entire decade, a measles outbreak, and an economic recession brought about through inflation. During the events of Disco Elysium, Revachal is still in the midst of that crippling recession, with almost all of its residents struggling to get by. As for where the gamer fits into this situation, you play a depressed cop who has just completed a three day long drinking binge. Just like Revachal, this cop has struggled to overcome the demons from his past, although what those demons are isn't as clear at the outset. Nonetheless, he, just like so many of Revachal's citizens, has given up trying to better his situation. In his despair, he drank so much that he not only couldn't remember that he was a cop, he even forgot his name. Though his interactions with a couple of NPCs help him remember that he is a cop attempting to solve a murder case, many other important details are left for him and the player to discover by interacting with the other characters. Of the many details that the gamer uncovers regarding our character's identity and the history of Revachal, the most important detail is the one common factor that every character and location shares. Throughout the game, we see omnipresent failures at attempting to overcome the past, be it a character's past or Revachal's. With these failures, there are various interpretations regarding why the failures happened and, often, the interpretations conveniently justify why they should either give up or not try harder than they already are. Now, in some respects, you can understand this reticence. Take the character of Plaisance, the owner of a failing bookstore. She has earnestly worked hard to make her business work going so far as to pull her child out of school in order to aid in promotion, but she still struggles. She blames that struggle on a supposed curse haunting the commercial area she occupies, which renders any business who sets up shop there as an inevitable failure. Depending on the person you are, you might sympathize with Plaisance, maybe because you believe in the curse, or because you feel that commerce in Revachal is borderline impossible due to the poor government by the Coalition. Or, you might be the type of person that suggests Plaisance isn't trying hard enough. Why doesn't she move to another area? Why not take up another profession? It seems to me that the game gives ample reason to believe in either side. Not in the curse, mind you. I mean the impact of economic recession. Normally, in real life, we might appeal to an ideological retort to explain the situation of somebody like Plaisance that she is either a victim of the system or not trying hard enough. We can do that comfortably because our perspective doesn't have an obviously direct impact on us. With Disco Elysium, we are forced to reflect on the truth of these reflexive retorts, because if we perceive the reality of someone's situation incorrectly, like with Plaisance, there's a good chance that the game might make you pay for it. For instance, Plaisance doesn't want you going to the back of her store because she believes it's haunted by the curse. However, the game hints that there might be something at the back of the store that might aid in your investigation of a murder. Now, you could disregard her feelings for what you think is a more important goal, or you could seek out a path of lesser resistance, just in case you need to maintain a positive relationship with Plaisance in order to complete future quests that might involve her be it with Plaisance or any other character in Disco Elysium, there will likely be consequences to your statements and actions, to whether or not you respect their version of reality. With this, Disco Elysium not only encourages you to think clearly and play nobly at every turn, but trains you to do so in real life as well. That said, after a few days pass in the game, you might start to notice that no matter how good your moral training is, no matter how clear of mind you are, getting most things done in Disco Elysium is very difficult. Around Day 4, the game offers a potential solution to those who tire of moral consistency and self-improvement, one that many people in real life rely on when their individual wills feel insufficient. You can align yourself with a political ideology and then seek out allies that help assert your will. Maybe you're fed up having to scrounge for money to pay your hotel bill, so you choose to align yourself with a mega-capitalist ideology which this game calls ultra-liberalism. 
Or maybe you think the solution to your and Revishal's problems is to return to outdated value systems, which aligns you in this game with fascism. You also have the choice of allying yourself with communism, or the coalition's centrist moralism, or you can be like me and refuse to align with any of these ideologies because there are clear problems with all of them. Regardless of whether or not you choose to pursue an ideology, the game makes you reflect on your choice by presenting a powerful counterpoint that you need to contend with. If you choose the coalition's centrist moralism, you have to justify why that ideology is represented by a sainted woman who was very likely a war criminal. If you become an ultra-liberal, you have to contend with the fact that no amount of money will ever insulate you from your personal and relational failures. Even if you don't make a choice, like I did, you will get an achievement that basically chastises you for being a fence-sitter. Again, the game is challenging you to see how far you are willing to go to defend your beliefs. In this case, it's challenging you to see if you are willing to break out of the safety and trappings of an ideology, to see if you can rely on your own will and moral compass. Can you entertain the ideas of your opponents and see where they're coming from, even if you don't agree? Can you maybe concede that your ideological opponents have a point in one or two regards? To forego reliance on ideology and instead develop oneself is the more difficult path, in both real life and in Disco Elysium. You will suffer more in the short term, confronting your own weaknesses as you strive to improve. But if you see things through, not only your character, but you, will feel more willing to accept and embrace the world as it is, be it our world or the world of Elysium. What will determine your success, however, is the strength of your will. To best demonstrate the gravity of this statement, I will circle back to a philosophical concept that I brought up in my Planescape video. Like the lead character in Disco Elysium, the lead character in Planescape, the nameless one, is an amnesiac. He too doesn't remember who he was or how he ended up where he is. Both Planescape and Disco encourage us to seek out our original identity, for the implied assumption is that who we originally were is the preferable identity. But this isn't necessarily true. I made a comparison in that video between the Nameless One and an ancient thought experiment posed by Plutarch, one called the Ship of Theseus. Here's a brief recap. According to legend, Theseus was the founder of the city of Athens, and he had a legendary ship that he used to rescue children from King Minos. After many centuries, workers have done everything they can to preserve this ship to honor Theseus's memory, which inevitably means replacing various parts of the ship. The question is, if every part of the ship of Theseus has been replaced, is it still the same ship? Applying this to Disco's main character and the Nameless One, if their memories and personality are taken away, are they the same as they were? What if they don't like who they were? Are they beholden to that original identity? Interestingly, both games offer different responses to this conundrum. With the Nameless One, he did some horrendous things in his past that most of us playing would never do. With the Amnesia, the Nameless One, by the grace of the gamer, can forge a greater path. However, Disco introduces a pertinent factor to this philosophical discussion, one that Planescape ignores. Though the main character of Disco is also an amnesiac, there is one thing about him that will never change. His instincts. His fundamental psychology. Though he might change from moment to moment like the ship of Theseus, the fundamental truth remains. Just as the ship remains a ship and floats on water, the main character is a human that remains a human, one with fundamental instincts that do not change. Now some might say that we have the will to negate these instincts and author our own path, which is all well and good, but Disco clearly holds the opposing view. This is best demonstrated with its aforementioned skill system. Before you play the game, you are tasked with not just determining what instincts you have, but your physical disposition as well. These are the fundamentals that do not change regardless of amnesia. As Friedrich Nietzsche brilliantly laid out in Beyond Good and Evil, 
Instincts govern our behavior more than we like to admit. One bad day could transform the most penitent man into a savage. While Disco argues that we cannot negate the instincts, it does argue that through strength of will, we can contend with them and, in some cases, make ourselves less susceptible to their whims. We can put skill points that we gain throughout the game into certain categories, allowing us to not only complete certain tasks that require certain stat numbers, but simultaneously feel like we are progressing our character and ourselves as people. I have never encountered any RPG that has a morality system that is this intuitive and this responsive. Even if this system doesn't elevate Disco Elysium to the level of most philosophical for myself, I can say without a doubt that it makes Disco Elysium the most immersive game I have ever played. It's a model that I hope more CRPGs, or RPGs in general, adopt for their games in the future. It should be noted that there is an interesting contrast here between Planescape and Disco on the matter of human nature. With Planescape, the most famous question that game poses is what can change the nature of a man? Its answer appears to be a will to believe. Just as everything in Planescape's universe is built upon belief, even a man's nature, his instincts, can be altered if one believes hard enough. In contrast, Disco appears to take the stance that while belief can make some things about reality change, Belief can't change fundamentals. While you can use belief to make things better, the fact you fundamentally must use belief does not change. Same thing goes for humans. While humans can use belief to alter reality, they cannot change their fundamental nature. After all, it is their nature that gives them the instinct, the will, to believe. In summary, we have the classic contention between free will and determinism between these two games. I could go into a long-winded analysis of whether or not free will is a valid concept, whether our beliefs alter reality or reality alters our beliefs. But ultimately, Disco Elysium demonstrates that the origin of belief is moot. Both Planescape and Disco put the same emphasis on the importance of belief, of meaning, in sustaining us. Even if our chosen belief is proven to be wrong, the choice to continue believing in something stronger, firmer, is something we must never lose sight of. Otherwise, our lack of belief, our lack of hope, will have an equally potent effect on reality. Just as belief shaped the cosmos in Planescape, the lack of hope in a better future and a nostalgia for the past is shaping the world of Elysium. There is this really interesting and really sad concept in the game known as the Pale. In the simplest terms I can manage, it's the physical manifestation of nothingness, of absence. Due to the combined pessimism in the world of Elysium, the Pale manifests and begins to swallow reality. When you don't hope for any new future, a future that progresses from the past, reality stagnates and breaks apart. It's a neat and terrifying idea, and gets across the importance of belief in something greater quite well. I will say though, of the million things that I am fond of in Disco Elysium, the one thing that I am not fond of is the linking of the pale to a nostalgia for the past. While the developers make a cogent point about why you should not root yourself in outdated and destructive ideas like the fascists do in this game, I'm of the belief that there are certain eternal truths that are worth looking back at and preserving. Though it is important for those old truths to progress, to shed skin and take on a new coat, some truths, like the snake who sheds its skin, remain consistent. Just as the boat remains a boat, as the snake remains a snake, and a human remains a human. To quote Solid Snake at the end of Metal Gear Solid 2, building the future and keeping the past alive are one and the same thing. Despite this slight difference in perspective, Disco Elysium's core point remains strong. One must never stop believing in a better future, in progress. To spend too much time dwelling on the past will cause stagnation, and if too many people do this at once, 
reality will accommodate it, whether it's in the form of the pale or something less metaphysical. Though Disco Elysium acknowledges through its story and its gameplay that the road to that better future is long and uncertain, the payoff will not only come, it might be, in some ways, unexpected and borderline miraculous. There is something that happens at the end of this game that validates this will to belief, even for those who believe in the most seemingly ludicrous things. Because I have kept this video mostly spoiler free, I won't reveal what that thing is. But when this moment happens, you will realize that sometimes, something that you believe to be incorrect will be proven true. And sometimes, that won't result in a wounded ego. It won't result in greater anxiety over life's uncertainty. In a few cases, that moment you are proven wrong might be the most beautiful and profound moment of your life, and that uncertainty will make you feel enchanted by life's infinite possibility. This video would not have been possible without my friend and Patreon supporter Arcane. He provided me a great deal of critical feedback to help make this script the best it could be. And thank you to Indy for helping me edit this video. Editing lately has been pretty difficult on account of my broken hand, but Indy and my other editors have helped keep things chugging along at our usual pace, so thank you very much. If you like this video, please give it a like. If you want me to do future videos on Disco Elysium, please let me know in the comment section. And finally, if you like the type of analysis I do on this channel, please consider supporting me on Patreon or joining my YouTube member section. I will put a link to both in the description box below. Thanks for watching, and until next time, stay yellow.